disaster is looming. A fabulous city, rich in culture and technological advances, is about to be destroyed. Buildings, people, an entire civilization swept away by an overwhelming natural disaster. For this is Atlantis, the ancient land that legend has it was sunk beneath the waves 11,000 years ago by a massive cataclysm. The story has entranced scientists and scholars for centuries. Now, Naked Science sets out to see if it can separate fact from fiction in the enduring legend of Atlantis. Atlantis is one of the most fascinating of all historical mysteries. Stories about the disappearance of this legendary island city have echoed down the centuries since it was first written about by the Greek philosopher Plato over 2,000 years ago. But is the drowned city of Atlantis just a myth? Or is the legend based on a civilization that really did exist? And why are so many of us so keen to believe in it? It's like a perfect place, the Garden of Eden, uh, the quintessential society. It did exist. And I think it's still there. It seemed like it was a very advanced society and that they had a lot of technology. It's heavenly and pretty and resort-like. <laughs> so if Atlantis did exist, where is it now? Naked Science travels the globe in search of the lost world and explores four possible sites for its watery grave. Our journey takes us to the shattered fragments of a Mediterranean island that 3,600 years ago was blown to pieces by a shattering volcanic eruption. We see the remains of a civilization that built the most ancient temple structures in the world before mysteriously vanishing. We then travel to the Caribbean to investigate strange underwater formations recently discovered off the coasts of Cuba and the Bahamas. Along the way, we meet optimistic amateurs who believe they have found the lost city, and some serious researchers studying genuine archaeological mysteries. But first, we must go back to the very beginning and the source of the legend. The story of Atlantis dates back to 350 BC, and the writings of the ancient Greek philosopher, Plato. Of all the writers of classical Greece, it's only Plato who mentions Atlantis, and he gives us the key clue for our search. He wrote that the island of Atlantis was annihilated by a massive destructive event, and in a single day and night, it disappeared into the sea. It's a great story, but before we set out on our quest, we wanted to know, is it really possible? Could a whole civilization be annihilated by a single catastrophic event and within hours? At first, it seems unlikely. The destructive forces of nature that our planet has experienced in recent times don't appear to be that big. In 1994, the Northridge earthquake shattered parts of Los Angeles and in 2004, Hurricanes Charlie, Ivan, and Francis decimated Florida. But they fell far short of wiping these places out. However, look back over a longer time scale, and the Earth is suddenly revealed as a truly explosive, violent place. Tsunamis have obliterated whole coastlines, killing hundreds of people and earthquakes have reduced towns and even cities to rubble. 
Volcanoes can explode with the force of nuclear bombs, destroying whole cities. The casualty list is impressive. Pompeii, Herculaneum, Krakatoa. So there are plenty of natural phenomena that could have been the basis for Plato's account. A key test for each of our four sites will be to show that they were annihilated by a massive cataclysm early enough to precede Plato's writings. To aid our search and assess the evidence, we call in two eminent scientists. Geologist Dr. Robert Schock of Boston University. This is very similar to catastrophe stories you see elsewhere around the world, common to many mythologies, common to many religious beliefs, and I suspect has a basis in reality. And Ken Fader, professor of archaeology at Central Connecticut State University. People have tried to make these connections, and it's been done so often between sites in off the coast of Cornwall and sites in the Mediterranean. Say, that's the story Plato was talking about. That's Atlantis. Even the strongest proponents of those, those perspectives admit you have to change a lot of elements of the story in order to make it fit. They have both studied the evidence for Atlantis and compared it to Plato's clues. But if we're going to find Atlantis, we need to know what to look for. Here, in the middle of our vast ocean, is Atlantis. Over the years, our image of Atlantis has been colored by the imagination of Hollywood screenwriters. Atlantis, a world that worshipped strange gods of science, a science gone berserk in the dread house of fear. So for our search, we must leave these science fiction fantasies behind and turn to Plato's original description. Exactly what clues has the Greek philosopher left us? His description of Atlantis comes to around 40,000 words and is peppered with remarkable details. He tells us that it was a vast city laid out in concentric circles of land and water. It was built of red, black and white rocks. The people sacrificed bulls. The land was grazed by elephants. And it existed around 9000 BC. But most important of all, it was destroyed by a catastrophe and sank beneath the waves. If any of our four locations is Atlantis, it must match all or at least most of these descriptions. The modern-day search for Atlantis owes its origins to one man, Ignatius Donnelly, a 19th-century politician and writer. Plato wrote this little tale about this fictional kingdom. Uh, Donnelly ran with it. Donnelly was intrigued by the similarities between ancient civilizations on both sides of the Atlantic. The pyramids of Central America, he thought, looked remarkably similar to the pyramids of Egypt, could they have had a common origin? In 1882, he published a best-selling book in which he proposed that the great technological advances of the ancient world all came from one earlier civilization, Atlantis. He argued that when Atlantis was destroyed, its survivors spread their knowledge across the globe, passing on the skills to build such diverse wonders as the Egyptian pyramids and the Mayan temples in Mexico. It's really Donnelly who introduces the whole concept that Atlantis is this mother civilization, this core culture from which everything else in the old, in the ancient world derives. Donnelly's theory sent Atlantis hunters rushing to the four corners of the earth. The story of the mythical civilization even attracted the attentions of Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. They became so entranced with the legend that they started to include it as part of their own myth of an Aryan master race. In one of the weirdest episodes of World War II, the Nazis began searching for Atlantis. Next, naked science travels to the tiny Mediterranean island that fought the Nazis to save itself and its ancient treasures. Naked hot on the trail of Atlantis, 
the elusive ancient civilization, rich in fine art, technology, and architecture, described by the Greek philosopher Plato in 350 BC. There are precious few facts to go on, but Atlantis has spawned all sorts of weird and wacky suggestions about where and what it was. Possibly the strangest of all dates back to the Second World War. In the 1930s, the German High Command dispatched SS officers to search for proof of Atlantis. Some of Hitler's Nazi Party colleagues believed the fabulous civilization had really existed and that the German people were descended from it. If they could find Atlantis, they believed it would bolster their claims of being the master race. One country that the Germans desperately tried to conquer was the strategically important Mediterranean island of Malta. But despite a deluge of German bombs, Malta bravely held out against the would-be invaders. In doing so, the island people prevented Hitler's Atlantis hunters from plundering their precious ancient treasures. These treasures are what lure us to Malta's shores. Could this island be the site of Atlantis? Only a few miles from Malta's capital, Valletta, lie some of the most intriguing ruins in Europe. Malta's magnificent megalithic temples were built around 3600 BC. That's 1,000 years before the Great Pyramids in Egypt. Who the temple builders were and what became of their culture is a fascinating mystery. Adriana Cacciatolo works for the Maltese Tourist Authority and has studied the history of the island's temple sites. She thinks the early civilization that lived here was so advanced that it could have been the basis for the Atlantis story. At the time of uh, their construction, they were the most sophisticated and advanced architecture anywhere in the world. 5,000 years ago, no one else was building structures like this. They are unique. And in terms of architecture, they were very advanced. Some of these stones weigh 20 tons. That's the weight of three double-decker buses. It was an incredible feat of engineering to move them across land and raise them into place. And there are other signs here of an advanced civilization at work. We have found very impressive examples of altar pieces with spirals carved in them. Also carvings of animals such as ram, pigs and sheep and fish. But do the temples have anything to do with Plato's Atlantis? Cacciatolo thinks they do. We also have evidence that there were animal sacrifices carried out in these temples. In one temple in particular, they found bull horns, incidentally also mentioned in Plato. But one animal Plato said lived in Atlantis appears to raise a problem for Malta's claim. The Greek philosopher wrote that Atlantis was home to a great number of elephants but you won't find one on Malta today. However, in the past, everything was different, especially at the island's earliest archeological site. This is the cave of Ar Dalam, the cave of darkness. The lowest strata of the cave dates back to about 500,000 years ago. In this layer, Archaeologists found fossils of animals that are not native to Malta, including dwarf elephants. So how did the elephants get here? The fossils suggest that in ancient times, Malta was joined to both mainland Europe and Africa. Then, over the centuries, the sea level rose, turning Malta into an island. The animals were marooned and eventually died out. 
There are other strange remains on Malta with echoes of Plato's Atlantis. Mysterious tracks have been found all over the island. Some experts believe they may have been highways used to transport agricultural produce and water for irrigation. Plato described an intricate network of waterways on Atlantis. Could these be the same? But if Malta is the site of Atlantis, the ruins shouldn't be on dry land at all. They should lie beneath the waves. We know of 24 temple units on 14 sites in Malta and the sister island Gozo. However, no one knows how many other temples there could be under the water. In the last five years, divers have discovered what may be more temples off Malta's coast. Could this be another link with the submerged city of Atlantis? Since the temples were built 5,000 years ago, the sea level has risen by almost 50 feet, which could explain the underwater structures. But this was caused by a gradual climate change and cannot explain the sudden disappearance of the temple builders themselves. At 2500 BC, the sophisticated culture simply disappeared. We don't know how, we don't know why, the temples were simply abandoned. What could have caused this civilization to just disappear? Geologists have found evidence of a major flood on Malta at the end of the temple builders era. At various ancient sites, mud deposits have been found containing animal and human bones and soil washed in from the fields. Some enthusiasts now suggest that the temple builders were wiped out by a tsunami. Tsunamis are usually triggered by earthquakes or volcanic eruptions. Earthquakes in the crust under the sea can generate giant waves capable of traveling thousands of miles to devastate any coastline they reach. If the people on Malta were destroyed by a tsunami, it would certainly match Plato's description of the floods that led to the end of Atlantis. So how does Malta shape up on our Atlantis checklist? There is evidence of bull worship. Elephants did once exist here. And the civilization may have been destroyed by a flood. However, the evidence for waterways is extremely weak. The rocks are shades of brown, not red, black and white. And the temples are only 5,000 years old. Our experts remain unconvinced. Here we have a mysterious very ancient civilization that we don't understand, we really know very little about. They seem to be very advanced in some ways, but just because we have these mysteries, I don't think that makes it Atlantis in Plato's sense. So the first of our four locations gets the thumbs down. Next on Naked Science, we leave the Mediterranean behind and travel across the Atlantic. We think the Bahamas was part of a maritime culture that was in operation during the Ice Age. And that maritime culture, for lack of a better term, is called Atlantis. Could these stones be part of an ancient building? Naked Science dives into the Caribbean to find out next. Is Atlantis fact or fiction? And if it did exist, does it now rest on the ocean floor, as some believe, a sunken city that has lain submerged for over 9,000 years? Naked Science is on a search for the legendary lost city of Atlantis. So far, we've investigated the ancient ruins on the small Mediterranean island of Malta, where the civilization was possibly wiped out by a tsunami. 
Although intriguing, Malta's ruined temples don't offer any hard evidence that they were the site of Plato's Atlantis. Perhaps we need to broaden our search and look further afield. Maybe Atlantis doesn't lie in Europe at all, but in America. In recent years, the idea that Atlantis lies in the Americas has become a New Age obsession. The idea stems from the bizarre utterances of self-proclaimed psychic Edgar Cayce. In the 1940s, Cayce made a whole series of astonishing claims about Atlantis, even predicting that it would rise again. Expect it, he declared, in 1968, in the area of Bimini, in the Bahamas. When, in 1968, a pilot flying over the Bimini Islands noticed a line of rectangular stones beneath the sea, Casey's followers thought his prophecy had come true. The formation, about 1,200 feet long, became known as the Bimini Road. Amateur sleuths and followers of Casey's psychic readings, Laura and Greg Little, believe that it's part of the lost island of Atlantis. There's two points of view on what the Bimini Road is. One of the points of view, which has been put forth by a handful of geologists, is that the Bimini Road was a huge piece of natural beach rock and that it fractured in these straight lines forming squares and rectangular blocks and that's what we're looking at. The second group of people believe that the Bimini Road was man-made and what it actually was was either a platform, could be a breakwater, or it may well have been a wall which collapsed. Greg and Laura Little figured that if the Bimini Road was part of Atlantis, then there should be other structures nearby. Hearing of a similar formation off the coast of Andros, the largest of the Bahamian Islands, they started searching the area. In 2003, Greg Little found an underwater formation that looked just like the Bimini Road. At first I saw nothing, the water was quite deep and it just was sand everywhere. And then all of a sudden, there this, these stones were. And I saw one after another after another and then I realized well, there's more layers. And I kept going further and further and I couldn't find the end of it. Didn't have much film left on his camera, he only got two or three shots of the blocks. And when we developed them and he showed them to me, I couldn't see it. So about a month later, we went back and this time I got out and snorkeled with him. And as we went along, you know, just regular seabed, and then all of a sudden, here's the blocks, and it's unmistakable. When you see them, it's just too consistent. The size, the lines are very straight. It's just unlike anything we've ever seen before. And I had no doubt once I saw it. I knew why he was excited, and, and we were both excited then. Without a geological expert to guide them, the Littles have convinced themselves that they have found a harbor or wharf many thousands of years old. It sits right next to the tongue of the ocean. And even if the ocean levels were 300 feet lower then, this platform would have sat right on the edge of the tongue of the ocean. You could have had massive structures on it, and it would have had a commanding view of any ships moving up and down this very deep channel that's quite wide. Greg and Laura Little are not scientists, but they have spent years researching mysteries all over the world, including many theories about Atlantis. Now they've returned to Andros to look for new evidence that the structures they found are man-made. If they can show that the stone blocks are the work of an ancient civilization, Greg believes it will rewrite the history of this region. Archaeology says that there were no human beings anywhere in the Bahamas till about 1000 AD, which is astonishing because we know that the rest of the Americas were settled thousands of years before that. Uh, and that, that would mean, if this was man-made, it would mean that this area was settled far earlier than that. So it would have to rewrite the history of the Bahamas. We think the Bahamas was part of a maritime culture that was in operation during the Ice Age. And that maritime culture, for lack of a better term, is called Atlantis. 
In support of their ideas, the Littles have investigated another stone structure, this time above water. These rocks lie on a hill on Andros Island. Some islanders suggest that they could be the remains of a hilltop fortification. This site has a commanding view over the ocean and the interior of the island, making it a perfect location for a fort or ceremonial building. No one knows how old the site is, but Laura Little believes that it could have been built by an ancient Indian tribe from the Americas. It does remind us an awful lot of what we've seen with Mayan ruins. The Mayans from Central America could have crossed the ocean to the Bahamas, trading and establishing communities. In theory, people could have settled these islands long before we thought. But if they did, what became of them? If the Little's theory is to stand up, they have to explain why there is no sign of people living on these islands before 1000 AD. It's possible that if people were here, they were wiped out by a natural disaster. But if some terrible event did obliterate them, what was it? Greg and Laura Little believe their end may have come from outer space. Their evidence comes from the eastern part of the United States, here, between Delaware and Florida, lie thousands of oval depressions known as the Carolina Bays. According to the Littles, around 11,000 years ago, a massive comet entered the Earth's atmosphere. It fractured into two major parts and millions of tiny pieces. The pieces smashed into the eastern half of the United States, creating the Carolina Bays, while the larger parts landed in the Atlantic Ocean. According to this theory, on land, the impacts caused flash fires that burned everything to a crisp. At sea, they created giant waves. When those two big pieces of the comet struck the Atlantic Ocean, they caused tsunami waves that I believe wiped these islands clean of everything that was on. That's why we can't find evidence of humans here before the year 1000, but that's why we can find something like the Bimini Road and this Andros platform. These are massive, built right at the edge of the water, and while everything on top of them may be swept away, the foundations themselves remain. There's just one problem with this theory. Scientists studying the Carolina Bays have found no evidence of a comet impact. Instead, they suggest that they were formed by glaciation or wind erosion, but they don't know for sure. Even though what created the Carolina Bays remains a mystery, Greg and Laura resolutely hang on to the belief that the Bahamas is the most likely site of Atlantis. In their hunt for new evidence, they trawl the area around the underwater stones they found last year. But this latest search is proving frustrating. Well, we were here four times last year. And since then, the bottom has been covered with sand. There's a lot more turtle grass on the bottom, too. Nevertheless, we did see a lot of areas that we didn't, we didn't see at all last year. Uh, actually, the formation is larger than we thought. I managed to clean off several seams between stones but I can't tell whether they're man-made or not. I'm not really disappointed, but I can say this, that if we don't find out within the next, next few years what this is, we probably won't know, because it'll be covered with coral by then. So what do mainstream scientists make of the Little's claims? Dr. Robert Schock is a geologist at Boston University. Does he think the Bimini Road could be the remains of Atlantis? I have to admit I've not been to Bimini um, to look at it firsthand, but what I've seen of the photographs, what I've seen of the best technical reports, which I have scoured through, I'm not even convinced it's artificial, much less Atlantis. And I have had experience diving on other sites that were said to be artificial and I found were absolutely natural, maybe unusual natural formations, but natural. You can get patterns in nature also. 
So how do the Bahamas rate on our Atlantis checklist? The underwater rocks are probably natural, not man-made structures destroyed by a catastrophe. We have no firm evidence of a catastrophic event pre-Plato, around 9,000 years BC. And there is no evidence of canals, red, black and white buildings, bull sacrifices, or elephants. If Atlantis ever existed, it almost certainly wasn't here. Despite Greg and Laura's passion, naked science has once more drawn a blank. So could our next location offer more hope? In 2000, a team of scientists searching the seabed off Cuba made an intriguing discovery. Deep below the waves, they found huge structures that may have been the work of an ancient civilization. Many people have claimed they have found the site of the mythical lost city of Atlantis. Now, naked science puts those claims to the test. So far, we've looked in the Mediterranean Sea and visited the Bahamas to dive down to unusual but unremarkable underwater formations. Next, we travel to the nearby island of Cuba. In deep waters off the Cuban coast, we've learned of other mysterious structures, which appear at first sight much harder to explain. Marine engineer Paulina Zalitsky and her husband Paul Weinswag worked together surveying the oceans of the world. But Atlantis was the last thing on their minds when they set off to search the seabed in December 2001. They had been hired by the Cuban government to search for sunken galleons containing treasure from the Spanish colonies. The seabed is 2,000 feet deep way too deep to scuba dive. So they survey the area with side-scan sonar, a device that uses sound waves to produce images of the sea floor. They don't find Spanish galleons, but they do find something unexpected. We saw a huge submarine, very large submarine. We don't know whose submarine, but it was right there in the area on ocean bottom. They had stumbled upon modern military activity in progress, but their encounter was brief. The submarine moved away before it could be identified. But a little later, their side-scan sonar lights up with another startling image. The graphics were, uh, had symmetry and, and geometry and architecture to it, uh, things that did not look natural. The structures look man-made, almost like something out of a James Bond movie. We decided that it's probably something related to submarines. Maybe it is a world underwater submarine uh, terminal, you know, very large, really large one, like international airport. <laughs> they take the data back to their laboratory for analysis. For months, Zelitsky plows through the scientific literature trying to find an explanation for what they have found. Every day, I studied for six, eight hours. The six months later, I lifted my face to the wall, and there was this Mayan calendar. The Mayan building on the calendar appears to match the images on the side-scan sonar. To her eyes, the underwater formation has a similar layout to ancient Mayan cities in Central America. Could the objects be man-made? Curious to learn more, Weinswag and Zelitsky sail back to the site. This time, they send down a submersible camera. The images they capture are highly unusual. There are regular shaped rocks, some of them forming structures almost 150 feet high, and they stretch over an area of eight square miles. These artists' impressions based on the side-scan sonar, reveal what the structures might look like. They appear man-made, but geologist Robert Schock is not so sure. 
what some people see as pyramids, maybe other types of buildings, maybe some kind of regular pattern suggesting some kind of urban layout, maybe if you want to call it a city. Very interesting, very intriguing, but is it definitive? I don't think so. What concerns Schock is that most ancient ruins lie at depths of less than 100 feet. No one has ever seen anything this deep. To have structures under 2,000 feet of water and to suggest that they're artificial, you have to explain that somehow. Could they be artificial conceivably? Yes, if there was some kind of tectonic activity, maybe a catastrophe like Plato describes that caused them to sink so deep. But still, this is something that really needs to be investigated. If there was a violent event that caused the land here to sink, no one knows what it was. But from circumstantial evidence he's collected, Paul Weinswag thinks the structures could once have stood on an island. When our uh, consulting geologist went out with us, he showed us, uh, he showed us the outlines of an existing island that had sunk. Could the structures at the bottom of the sea have once looked like this? According to Weinswag, a story uncannily similar to the Atlantis tale appears in the oral legends of the Yucatan province of Mexico. It describes the origins of the native people. These origins were traced to an island that sank to the east of Mexico uh, in a great cataclysm. Uh, in and one night. In a single night. And this island had been peopled by a tall white race uh, that had seeded the advanced forms of culture, architecture, astronomy, agricultural science, and so on. So is there any possibility that this is Plato's Atlantis? How does the Cuban site fare on the naked science checklist? If the structures are man-made, then they must have been sunk by a catastrophe. But there is no indication of when it was or any sign of red, black, and white rocks. And hardly surprisingly, there is no evidence of circular canals, bull worship, or elephants. Intriguing? Absolutely. Science still has a lot of work to do in Cuba's deep sea. But is this Atlantis? Probably not. I'm not convinced that they're artificial, much less Atlantis. But do I leave the possibility open? Yes. It deserves a lot more investigation. Weinswag and Zelitsky have already planned their next expedition with manned submersibles and vastly improved lighting and photographic equipment. They hope that next time they will bring back conclusive proof of a great ancient civilization that once thrived in the Caribbean. Having had little success here, we head back once more across the Atlantic to the Mediterranean. Our last candidate, and perhaps the strongest contender for Atlantis, is an island that lies close to ancient Greece. Here, one of the most sophisticated cities ever to have arisen in the ancient world was blown to smithereens in one of the worst natural disasters in human history. Perhaps this is, once and for all, the origin of the legend of Atlantis. Naked Science is on the trail of Plato's lost city of Atlantis. Although explorers and cranks have claimed dozens of sites to be the remains of the lost civilization, probably the best candidate of all is the Greek island of Santorini. Here in 1967, archaeologists sensationally discovered a beautifully preserved ancient city buried deep below the earth. They quickly established that it belonged to an advanced civilization, the Minoans, based on the nearby island of Crete. Famous for their magnificent palaces and beautiful frescoes, the Minoans controlled a vast empire long before the rise of classical Greece. But about 3,400 years ago, they suddenly and mysteriously disappeared. 
Might this be the civilization of which Plato spoke? The stunning discovery drew the attention of scientist and writer Charles Pellegrino. The city itself is a very fascinating find. When they started finding internal plumbing through the walls of the homes, very advanced technology, advanced use of water, and uh, aqueduct systems, the like of which we did not really see again uh, till about the time of the Roman Empire. Like many others, Pellegrino began to wonder if Santorini was the site of Plato's Atlantis. There are several similarities. For instance, the island's circular outline is reminiscent of the circular shape Plato describes, and from the small statues of bulls and the frescoes of bull leapers, it's clear that the Minoans, like Plato's Atlanteans, worship the bull. And there's more. Plato says Atlantis was made up of rocks which were black, white, and red. The same is true of Santorini. If you pull rocks out of here rather randomly, you'll find the original bedrock limestone, the original bedrock volcanic rock, interestingly, just as Plato had described the rocks of Atlantis. But there's one thing above all else that makes people sit up and take the idea seriously. Santorini and its city were destroyed by a massive volcanic eruption. We're right now on the very edge of an eight mile wide blowhole in the earth. All of it going off right in this spot. The explosion was 90 times bigger than the eruption of Mount St. Helens. As the volcano erupted, it spewed out a massive pyroclastic flow, a terrifying avalanche of hot rocks and scalding gases. Races across the land, slashing down trees, ripping up buildings, acting more like a fluid than a gas. And it's also very, very hot. It's hard to believe that a single volcanic blast can wipe out an entire city in minutes. But there have been many cases where this has happened. This is Saint-Pierre on the Caribbean island of Martinique. Above the town sits Mount Pele. The volcano is peaceful now, but on May 8th, 1902, it blew its top. A superheated cloud of gas and volcanic ash surged down the volcano and tore into the town of Saint-Pierre. The inhabitants stood no chance. 29,000 people were killed. Only two survived. In more recent times, pyroclastic flows destroyed Plymouth, the former capital of the volcanic island of Montserrat, when they roared down the slopes of the volcano and buried the town. The ash and debris are so deep that today, only the tops of the houses are visible. But the eruption on Santorini was much bigger than this. From the layers of rock and ash laid down in the blast, Charles Pellegrino is able to paint a detailed picture of the events surrounding the eruption. That creamy layer out there on top of that splinter of land that's left at the rim of the crater is about 200 feet of white pumice, which is marking the eruption as it was building and building and building toward the final explosion, the great Ahum. This eruption was going on and on, emptying the magma chamber, creating a weak spot in the earth, and building up toward the top here until finally the thing collapsed, released the pressure, exploded. After blowing its top, the volcano collapsed, creating a hole the size of Manhattan in the center of the island. In the immediate aftermath of that explosion, you would have seen the water coming in over these cracks in what was left of the island, and uh, one of these ships would have looked like just a mere twig going over the edge of Niagara Falls, and this would have made Niagara Falls look like a little trickle. 
Almost 4,000 years of history was derailed in an entirely new direction. It was pretty much the end of Minoan civilization, and that's what we're looking at up here. It was the end of their world. So could Santorini itself be the true site of Atlantis? It had a sophisticated culture, and it was certainly wiped out by a lethal cataclysm. But there's just one problem. Plato says that Atlantis was destroyed 9,000 years earlier, and the explosion at Santorini happened around 1630 BC, only 1,300 years before Plato was writing. It's a major drawback, but it doesn't change Charles Pellegrino's conviction that this may well be the site of Atlantis. There are scholars who've been arguing for years over whether Plato really meant 9,000 years ago or whether he meant 900 years ago. What Plato says is he says it's a story based on something real and you have to give him the right to be able to exaggerate if what he was creating was a kind of fable. So how does Santorini fare on our Atlantis checklist? Admittedly, it isn't as old as Plato said. And there are no signs that elephants lived here. But the rocks are the color Plato described. It had a circular shape. There was definitely a strong cult of bull worship. And a huge part of the island sank beneath the waves. But is this enough to make it Atlantis? To ancient Greeks like Plato, the legends of the Minoans must have made them sound like a kind of super race. And their dramatic demise would certainly have inspired the poet in him. But some of our experts believe that too many of the facts about the Minoans have been twisted to fit Plato's story. How many elements of the story are you allowed to change and still say, well, they're the same story? Well, in, in some cases, we have to change how long ago it happened, where it's located, how large it is. I can make a rat a cat by changing elements of that rat, but that doesn't really make a rat and a cat the equivalent. The Minoans were an advanced civilization. But was Atlantis one of their cities? Perhaps we shall never know. On our journey, we've traveled the world in search of Plato's Atlantis, examining some of the sites that enthusiasts and believers consider to be the leading contenders. On Malta, we discovered a forgotten civilization of temple builders. Their phenomenal feats of engineering predating even those of ancient Egypt. In the Bahamas, we found mysterious structures that some people link to Atlantis, but are probably natural stones. Deep under the sea off the coast of Cuba, we saw ghostly images of what could be an entire island with buildings intact, apparently sunk into the ocean depths. And on the island of Santorini, we learned of the Minoans, a sophisticated culture on Plato's own doorstep wiped out in one of the worst volcanic eruptions in history. In each place, we have seen fascinating parallels with Plato's description of Atlantis. But none fits the story perfectly. Naked science concludes that, based on the evidence we have, Atlantis must remain a mystery, no more than a myth. But one thing is for certain. In the future, more thrilling archaeological discoveries will be made in the world's oceans. And who knows, maybe naked science could yet be proved wrong Maybe somewhere out there, waiting to be discovered, is the place that Plato called Atlantis.